Okay, today's seminar is an important one. Um, sorry, just letting more people in the room. <laughs> Um, is an important one for the Australian Evaluation Society as one of its key strategic priorities is to strengthen culturally safe evaluation practice and processes and ensure that cultural safety is, in this, is an essential evaluation competency. And today's seminar contributes to this by providing us with an opportunity to learn, to explore and to discuss what culturally safe practice looks like particularly in Northern Territory contexts. In this seminar, Dr. Robin Williams will provide an overview of cultural safety as a decolonization model of healthcare, specifically, but not exclusively for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Uh, Robin will also talk about the history, contention, criticisms of, and necessity for cultural safety, along with the principles of cultural safety. Robin will also share her experiences of negotiating culturally safe practice and the need for organisations and systems to have and use cultural safety frameworks. So we're very fortunate to have Robin with us today uh, as a leading light in the area of cultural safety. And I'll now hand over to Robin to uh, tell us a bit more about herself and start the session. Um, thanks, Alison. To begin, I would also like to acknowledge the, and respect the Larrakia people as the traditional owners of the and ongoing custodians of the land where I live and work. I also acknowledge that the Larrakia land is unceded and I'm an uninvited guest. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that might be attending this seminar. Also to my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander family, friends and colleagues, I acknowledge that you motivate me to keep doing what I do. Now, um, just a little bit about me because I do like talking about myself. So um, <laughs> bear with me because this, this all has a purpose. This is, I'm just giving you a synopsis of my journey, uh, how I've got to what I'm doing now and, and all the, the con contributing factors and the components that, that went into that. Um, I will today I will be focusing on my experiences of cultural safety in the health system because that's where I've predominantly worked but also because I've got an education background um, hopefully what will come across is that you can you you need to know and and use cultural safety across a, a whole variety of settings and and sectors so a little bit about me um, I'm a non-Indigenous woman in my mid-60s, and that's the cue for when you go, no, can't possibly be, uh-huh. Um, I'm from, um, I'm fourth generation Australian of mixed British descent, predominantly Welsh, and I'm a self-titled third generation humanitarian and health worker. I have three younger siblings, um, strong connections with the extended family, and grew up with an inclusive family environment and gatherings like we you know we always had um, people staying foster kids and and the like my parents have always been very active community members uh, wherever we lived we moved around a lot when I was growing up and they both hold strong ecumenical Christian beliefs engendering in all of their children a keen aware and a keen awareness of civic responsibility and also the need to be involved in a range of community activities sports, education, volunteering, and so on. So we lived in several different locations in southeastern Australia prior moving to the NT approximately 40 years ago. Um, well, actually 40, closer to 42. My parents moved to Darwin at the beginning of 1976, and my youngest brother and sister went to Darwin High. So I, I wasn't born here, didn't really grow up here, but I'm from here, if, if that makes sense. Dad worked for the YMCA and his um, job was to set up sport and rec programs in remote communities. One man, the entire Northern Territory, not a problem. As you can see the, by the photos that are there, they sort of represent various aspects of my life. I was destined to become a nurse at an early age, but uh, 
Um, I fought that for a long time, <laughs> eventually giving in and coming up here to do my nursing training in 1980. Um, I was the first person to, in my immediate family to go to university, mostly due to the changes enacted by the Whitlam Labor government at the time in the, um, the mid-70s. I completed an arts degree majoring in Aboriginal studies and politics at the Australian National University in Canberra. Then, um, because I didn't want to be an anthropologist and, um, and still don't, um, I decided that I would do my general nursing training at um, Royal Darwin Hospital. I was in the first group in the new hospital, for those that know it. And I, um, uh, because I wanted to work in remote communities um, in the NT. So after a few years of nursing, I thought the next logical step would be to broaden my professional skills and undertake a graduate diploma of education. Um, which at the top was a primary because they didn't have adult education then. So I worked as a teacher and educator in urban and remote communities for a further few years to consolidate my teaching practice. After that, I commenced a job writing for curricula for the original NT Aboriginal Health Worker courses at um, Bachelor, well, it was Bachelor College then, Bachelor Institute in the, from the late 1980s. And despite having worked remote for several years, this was a steep learning curve for me. It was my first in-depth and sustained exposure to the contested and intensely political space of Indigenous health. I had no idea. How my jugular survived, I'll never know. After five years and the birth of my second child, I commenced work as a lecturer at the Faculty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies at FATSIS, familiarly known as FATSIS, at um, what was NTU and became CDU. I taught and coordinated numerous different courses there for nearly 10 years. And this was probably my second steep learning curve um, as the students were predominantly urban based and that just required significant recalibration on my part. Upon reflection, this was my first um, experience really of culture shock or significant culture shock um, at, or at least discomfort and dissonance. So it really made me question my practice, which um, as you will see, it sort of led me on the cultural safety pathway. I think maybe this was because I was working from a position of assumed similarities amongst uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And this was part of the journey of questioning assumptions and learning about the everyday realities of ongoing colonization. As the students and I built our relationships, because I had those poor people for 30 hours a week for 18 weeks a semester, bonds forged in steel. But anyway, in the main part, we developed trust and knowledge. And I still have very strong connections with many of the students some 27 years later. During this period, I maintained my nursing registration and that professional skill set and undertook many short term projects and consultancies for the government, non government and various ARCHOs, Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisations. And that with this pattern continuing for the next 15 years or so. Approximately 10 years ago, yeah, almost 10 years ago, I experienced an epiphany or catalyst that led to undertaking my PhD study. Because uh, along the way, I did a master's of education, which was really interesting because I'd been teaching for a while by then. Anyway. As part of a three week remote orientation program for nurses, I co-facilitated a two day workshop on working cross-culturally. Mr. R was a young man fresh off the plane from Tasmania and was heading out to a remote community in Arnhem Land with his wife and young child. During the introdu introductions, he commented that he had not knowingly ever met an Aboriginal person, but he was feeling fairly confidently clinically and wasn't afraid to ask questions. About a third of the way into the first session on exploring culture and engaging effective in effective communication, Mr. R signaled that he wished to speak and said, no offense, but this cultural safety stuff is bullshit and I can't see what it has to do with my job. Fair enough. I commended him on feeling comfortable enough to speak his mind and the group proceeded to have quite a robust discussion. 
but he and some others remained unconvinced and somewhat resistant to the idea, relevance and challenge of cultural safety. 18 months later, Mr. R participated in an NT Department of Health workshop on chronic conditions where I was facilitating, facilitating some sessions. He sought me out, much to my initial alarm, and told me that he'd been thinking about what I said in the previous workshop and that now it was starting to make sense. This got me thinking and wondering what it was that was the catalyst for those light bulb moments and how educators and others could create opportunities for reflective and critical thinking. Eventually the question I asked was, what preparation do health professionals need to work effectively and safely in Indigenous primary health care settings, urban, rural and remote? And that led me to eventually, many years later, completing my thesis. Um, just before I move on to the next slide, the, the middle slide, you can see there's an older Aboriginal man and the, a white man on the right. That's my dad and his best friend in the entire world. I absolutely, both have passed. Um, I have permission to use the photo. And they, um, the man on the left, um, he was a well-known um, painter and his, um, he had an outstation out of Gunbalanya, Gunrangbang, for those that know that area. And dad worked in that area. Um, he worked out there for seven or eight years with, um, when he worked with cats and they had the most beautiful friendship and I think this is one of the things that in fact dad's ashes are out at Gumrangbang um, next to that old man and, and his wife and I think that's just one of the things that keeps me true is that really it's all about the relationships and in order to be culturally safe it's about developing the trust and um, developing those relationships and working it out from there, really. Okay. So um, I'm going to, as Alison said, I'm talking about cultural safety, these, these sort of three main topical areas. So cultural safety um, as, it, as it stands, as a model, what culturally safe practice um, might look like. And I'm going to go through an example of a cultural safety framework because it's all very well talking about concepts and ideas and philosophies and what we should be doing, but how we actually do it, that's really the next big step. Excuse me while I catch up with myself. Okay, so why this topic? Well, you know, because, just because, um, I think I came into cultural safety. I was lucky enough to hear Ira Hubley Ramston, who was the, one of the main Māori um, generators of this um, model and the how much it resonated with me working with people from other cultures, but not just people from other ethnicities, but also people from various groups and cultures. And the fact that what essentially drives me is the quest to, <coughs> excuse me, working in air conditioning, it's not good for your health. <coughs> um, health inequities that sort of, and cultural safety fits in quite nicely with that about human rights, but also it's about us as professionals, whether it's health, education, community development, whatever, it's about us being accountable and knowing and um, being responsive to our professional mandates and addressing our ethical obligations. And the bottom line is that any culturally safe, uh, culturally unsafe work practice leads to poor quality outcomes. Um, now, look, some of you will know a lot, others won't know much, others will have, and everyone's got their own idea. So I'm just going to give an overview of cultural safety. There are many, many, many terms that are used interchangeably, like cultural awareness, cultural humility, cultural competency, and so on and so forth. They are not cultural safety. There is overlap 
but they're not cultural safety and should not be used interchangeably. Um, okay, so it, originally it's an Indigenous knowledge or construct. It uh, has its roots in the field of nursing education and healthcare from Aotearoa. Jeez, I hope I said that right. New Zealand, and it's based, as I said before, on the work of Dr. Irahabdi Ramsden and others. Um, in terms of, and it was it generated from um, the experience in questioning of some Māori student nurses and how their lecturers and others responded. It's about working towards social justice and better health outcomes for those experiencing health inequity. And there's a there, there's a quite a, a strong overlap between um, the philosophical frameworks of primary healthcare and community control for organisations. And I'll I'll illustrate that a bit more specifically uh, when I talk about the cultural safety framework. It's a decolonizing model of practice based on dialogue, communication, power sharing, and negotiation and also acknowledgement of whiteness and privilege. It's a means to challenge racism at personal and institutional levels and to establish trust in, in the encounters, whether it's health or whatever, um, whatever other area. And it also recognizes, and it took me a while to bring this to the front of my brain, that there are other indigenous cultural domains that have a particular way of doing business that the mainstream can learn from. So cultural safety is a, is, a, is a brilliant example of that in many ways. It's a gift to the world saying, look, this is a really great way of doing business. Um, look and learn. It's also, cultural safety is all about, also about how people are treated in society. And it's not just about individuals um, having cultural self-awareness. It's very much systemic and structural. And of course, related in the health sector to the social determinants of health. It's also very clearly a philosophy of practice that is about how a professional does something, not necessarily what they do in order to not engage or perpetuate unsafe cultural practices. So it's how someone does something that's the critical thing there. And also in terms of nursing where it originated, and I think you can broaden this out. It represents a key philosophical shift from providing care regardless of race, creed, colour, which was transcultural nursing. So um, for a long time, nurses have been very proud that they treat all people the same. You know, I don't see colour, we treat all people the same. It's the precise opposite of what cultural safety is because oh, cultural safety is about responding to the person that you have in front of you. It's also a process that requires hard conversations. It requires an ongoing process of self-reflection, cultural self-awareness, so know who you are and who, what your beliefs, values and attitudes, worldviews and so on, and how that impacts on your interactions with others. And also, how an acknowledgement of how these impact on care. And I've spotted my first typo. And this is, this is I think, where a lot of people, um, many, many people struggle. Cultural safety is not just about culture. It's not just about ethnicity. But all of us being human, we see the word culture or cultural and we go off onto all these lovely little tangents. But cultural safety is not just about ethnicity. It's about all these things you see there, age, generation, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, religious or spiritual beliefs, gender, ability or disability. So, you know, there's, there's, a, whole, there's a whole spectrum and different sections of population. And also it... it explicitly acknowledges that the various professions and workplaces have cultures and it's just as applicable to the people that you work with as it is to actual service delivery so it's not letting us off the hook in other words 
And you can only ever work, the, the bad news is it's a bit like when I discovered that in vivo wasn't actually going to analyze my data for me. <laughs> Cultural safety, there is no end point. It's a lifelong journey, which will, I'm sure most of you have already figured out. So it's not about progress through certain levels of awareness, even though you will see that, that's how it's set out in some texts and some people's ways of thinking about it as a staged or, or, or progressive model. Um, so it's not a, a linear continuum. The process is a lifelong one. And one of the many things that you have to keep in mind is that it isn't the study of any culture other than one's own. So you can be open-minded and flexible towards others. So you're not going and learning about other cultures. That's not part of cultural safety. Um, well, it is, but it's not the key element. So figuring out what makes other people different is relatively straightforward. But understanding our own culture and how in its influence on how we think, feel and behave is much more complex. That's where the, you know, the that's where we have to do the, the reflective practice. So um, oh, where are we? I've lost my little. There it is. So this is um, what I'm now going to talk about is navigating the cultural safety maze. And it might feel like you're a little bit like a rat in a trap, but um, it's, you know, you will get there to wherever you're going and then you keep on going. So what I'm gonna talk about now is about negotiating culturally safe practice. What, and what I'm saying here is, is, is some very common experiences and responses, but it's not prescriptive. And it's a bit like the massive amount of information you get when you have a child. And a very, for example, a very well-meaning friend of mine, when I had my first child, gave me a book. It was one of the seminal texts on pregnancy and child rearing. And I read in my state, I read that the child should be dressing itself by the time they're five months old. That's what I read. Now, <laughs> that's because you're, um, we all have different experiences and different ways of seeing things and different preparedness and different receptiveness and different states of being. So what I'm talking about in these next few minutes is like a bit of a, a soup of common experiences and how people may or may not progress. So these, these are stages or steps, but they're not um, linear or a straight line progression. And I think probably the bottom line is that individual, every individual needs to be supported to negotiate culturally safe practice. It's not something you can or should do on your own. So this is often where we start and puddle around for a while. The journey is different for each individual, but there are some commonalities or overlap, as I said before. So the most common starting point or common state of being is that we're simply not prepared for culturally safe practice. It's not something you wake up necessarily knowing what to do. And it's where you have little knowledge or understanding of other cultures or, or even cultural self-awareness. You get minimum preparation from your education and or your workplace. And you go through a range of fluctuating emotions. For example, feeling overwhelmed is very, very common, and I'm sure we all experience that. Often feel guilty, fear and anxiety, there's sadness, and there's quite often shame. When you find out um, who you are and the, and the impact and also um, the position that you op op occupy in society, so then the majority of us, we start to navigate the maze where we try and sort of neutralise or minimise the differences in an effort to get along with people and not put yourself above um, our people. You sort of, oh, you know, we're not so different, you know. I've, yeah, I've had troubles in my life as well. 
or you might avoid um, avoid seeing the differences. And where this is where a lot of people get stuck, denying the need to change. No, I'm all right. It's just a matter of, of um, pushing through. And th these are very common states of being. And you, we all know people, we've all been there, and we all know people that do it. So what we tend to do and what we need to do, not always the same thing. Most commonly, people will take the next step. So we'll wing it. We're in a new situation. What I'm used to doing isn't working or not working all that well. So let's let's see how we can work our way through this. And this, this, most people do this. And this is a good time where we can critically review the level of cultural self-awareness. Okay, so maybe it's something to do with me and how and who I am. And this is certainly what happened to me when I was coordinating the CERT for project officers, Aboriginal project officers course at the uni. I couldn't understand things. I developed good relationships with most of the students, why they weren't, why so many weren't, still weren't completing or even handing in assignments, let alone completing. And so I had to take a good hard look at myself and saying, okay, what is it? What is it about me and the situation? And make adjustments on that. Also, you then you're, you're looking for solutions. So you're sourcing information, um, education, looking for mentors. Uh, I was extremely lucky at um, where I was working at the time where I had so many fantastic colleagues to debrief with and you know mop up the blood if it had been a particularly torrid day and being able to so looking for people that can mentor you and debriefing with peers absolutely um, very very necessary and we all need that doesn't matter where we work we all need that so working towards being culturally safe, it's when you sort of, when you get to a point where you're considering a range of cultural differences and worldviews, so you're considering them. And certainly for those of us working in the NT or, you know, in an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space, accepting the impact of colonisation on social, cultural and health outcomes has been significant and it is ongoing and critically reflecting on your own values, beliefs, experiences, and practices. It's, it's, it's so important. And as I've said a few times, this is a cycle or a spiral, not a linear continuum with an end point. This is, um, this, I, I found this when I was um, putting this together. And this, um, <laughs> I think this pretty well reflects my the progress of my state of mind and my and where I'm currently at. You know, you have light bulb moments and then you have moments of like, I don't get it. And then, oh yeah, here we go again. Okay, now cultural safety, you know, like anything, there are issues and challenges. The main one for me is the conceptual confusion particularly how, where it positions cultural safety as only relevant to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander contexts. It certainly is directly relevant and incredibly necessary and useful, but it's not the only context. To do so basically ignores the diversity of cultures, intra and intercultures, and the existence of other cultural groups in Australia like LGBTQIA+. We all need to stop focusing on cultural awareness as a standalone. Yes, cultural awareness or self-awareness, cultural orientation, incredibly important. And we've many of us have fought long and hard to get this as part of um, at least orientation. But we need to stop focusing on cultural awareness as a standalone. And okay, like if you do, you know, this three-hour workshop, you'll be fine. You'll be able to be at one with the people. And also to stop equating cultural safety with attempts to learn other people's culture. That's simply not what it's about. And we, we have to continually grapple with the impact of our individual culture or cultures, that is cultural self-awareness, 
and those of the systems and the society in which we work. It's, it's ongoing. So culturally safe work practice, what does that actually mean? It's a, about having respect for culture, knowledge, experience and obligations at where there is no assault or challenge of a person's identity, everybody to be treated with dignity. So it's a mutual um, thing. It's about negotiating and sharing the power by recognizing client expertise and considering alternative ways of working. So it's about being flexible, essentially. And acknowledge that beliefs and understandings that people hold, and in the bulk of the work that I've done concerning health and ill health, that these are strong determinants of their relate, health related behaviors or any related behaviors. It might seem blindingly obvious to people, but when we're at the coalface, we tend to forget or underestimate that, I think. Now I'm going to talk about a cultural safety um, framework that I developed for um, a local ACHO, Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, or, or actually peak body. Now those of you in the NT will know who I'm talking about pretty quickly, but <laughs> um, I'll just, you know, I'll try and keep it general. So after many, because it's all very well having a philosophy of practice. It's all very well having um, uh, a sound and comprehensive orientation to the organisation. But how do organisations actually do this? What are the, what are the practicalities? How do, how do we actually do this? So in order for an organisation to be culturally safe or be working towards being culturally safe, there needs to be a framework. There's a million and one frameworks around. There's cultural respect, cultural frameworks, a whole range of things. But how do we actually enact this? So this particular cultural framework that I developed in consultation and working with people from this particular organisation. So this is the, the, the outline of the, um, the framework. So it's got a background and rationale it's about embedding cultural safety in, in an organisation. It, what it means for individuals, the organisation and the systems we work in. And it's about how do individuals and the organisations negotiate culturally safe practice. There's um, a meeting in the room next door and they're very, very noisy. Uh, cultural safety framework. Okay, so this is the example. So this cultural safety framework aims to facilitate a process for preparation of staff to work effectively in, the, in this particular sector. So it's about um, framing the whole process so that staff can come in and be effective and safe. It's about contributing to better preparation and support of staff so it's about the, the first bit's about orientation of the staff. So new people bringing them in and saying, okay, how can you work effectively with us? How can we get, you know, the best mutually beneficial deal? The second bit's about can, a framework contributes to better preparation and ongoing support of staff so they can work towards cultural safety and ultimately lead to better outcomes for the people in their jurisdiction, for the clients in their jurisdiction. And it applies to everyone. It's not just for non-Indigenous people coming in, but it's everyone coming into and working in the organisation. So the rationale and purpose of the framework is that it provide a framework provides a whole of organisation approach. It includes cultural orientation programs that are sustainable and provide tools that enable the participants to do their job more effectively. One of the common criticisms of cultural awareness programs, like I said before, they have their place, but one of the common criticisms or concerns, or maybe that's a bit strong, but what the, a lot of the evidence shows that cultural awareness programs can be great, interesting, um, and provide some very useful information, but often they tend to be very generic. So they're not 
and they need to be contextualized. They need to be context dependent uh, and generated. And they need also to be, uh, and they don't provide, sorry, they don't provide people with the tools to use this information to do their job more effectively. And that's what people want. Like they need a combination. They need the information, but they also need the tools. Okay, now, now that I know this, what's the relevance and how do I use it? The framework also embeds the process of critical ref reflection, which is a crucial component of any cultural orientation program specifically and culturally uh, safe practice in general. So um, just, I'm probably, you know, teaching a few people to suck eggs here, but just in terms of cultural safety, critically reflective practice, aims for cultural self-awareness, where the self um, refers to both uh, individuals like staff and organisations, um, requires practitioners and organisations to recognise and accept that their culture's impact on practice. It's a process of inquiry where people can identify and challenge their values, beliefs and attitudes and assumptions, their social position and standpoint. And that, that can be very challenging. It enables the power sharing and negotiation that I talked about before between practitioners and the organizations they work for, because it's simply not enough to be nice. You have to acknowledge the power differentials and how and the impact that that has. This is in order to limit the impact of professional and service cultures on the social practice of decision-making. So people can genuinely um, negotiate decisions that benefit them. So the aim of the project, uh, sorry, the framework was to provide an organization-wide cultural safety framework, adopting multiple approaches. The objectives were to map out what cultural safety is to that particular organization, to provide a template of how to negotiate culturally safe practice, and to address recruitment and retention issues. Because for many, many reasons, recruitment and retention is a huge issue and having a cultural safety framework is one way of addressing this. So the framework, the core values of the framework were based on the principles of cultural safety, which I won't go into again. Um, suffice to say that that's what informed this particular framework. So the framework's principles based and it was um, underpinned by a broad set of principles. So there were ARCHO primary healthcare principles um, and principles from a couple of other, um, a couple of other sets of principles that were directly relevant and cultural safety. And those four sets there um, are the, what came, what um, came out of uh, mapping all those principles. And so they're the four key areas in terms of principles, if that makes sense. Now, these principles then inform the, the three domains. So three domains, leadership and accountability, self-determination, community control and empowerment, creating a strong, supportive, strong and resilient and culturally safe workforce. So the, and the three domains then inform the outcomes, which we'll see in a minute. I'm not going to go through each of those, you'll be very pleased to hear each of those um, three domains, but basically for each domain, it sets out what the focus is and the actions that are required from whom or what. So this is where the practical, um, uh, the practicalities of the framework are, are beginning to be specified. So what do you have to do as a leader? What do you have to do as an organization? What do you have to do as an individual? And that's just the, um, the, the second slide because we couldn't all fit it into the first one. <clears throat> now the outcomes of the framework will be a cultural safety policy for the organization, a code of conduct in regarding cultural safety, 
and the Reconciliation Action Plan. Many organisations still struggle with get, even getting a wrap up, um, but that's not to replace or in lieu of a cultural safety framework. A wrap's a very important part or an outcome of a cultural safety framework. For this particular organisation, the cultural orientation modules of six, uh, you know, six cultural orientation modules, uh, capacity building and upskilling, so in terms of ongoing staff development, and formal roles for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff, including educators, mentors and advisors, so it would be formally recognised as part of their roles and they would be remunerated for those. Ultimately, the thing to take away is that it's the receiver of the services who determine if your service was culturally safe or not. A quick little plug and shameless self-promotion for a book that I co-edited, which was published last year. And I think that's pretty much it. Um, I believe that the, your co-conveners of the session are going to manage if there are any questions. But what I want you to be thinking about is what is one key message that you'll take away from today's session, apart from the fact that I can talk a lot. And now I'm going to stop sharing. You'll be very relieved to know. Thank you very much, Robin. I've got um, one question here in the chat from earlier on in the session. Uh, and it says, I'm very interested to hear from you about the distinction between cultural humility and cultural safety. Is the latter the only model we should focus on in healthcare settings? Uh, <laughs> look, people, really it's up to people and various organisations to decide what they want to work with and why, like it really is, because I'm not saying one is better to use than the other. But what I am saying is not to use various terms interchangeably because cultural humility is not the same as cultural safety. Uh, I did quite a bit of work with IHA, Indigenous Allied Health Australia. They've chosen a cultural responsiveness framework. They developed a cultural responsiveness framework. They see cultural res responsiveness as an action of cultural safety. And that's the path that, that, that they've taken. Um, I think it's it's not a matter of what, I, I, look, I don't really want to sort of go down the rabbit hole of what cultural humility is, but I think perhaps humility is a component of cultural safety, like um, self-awareness is also a component of cultural safety. But cultural humility and other such um, terms to my mind, they're, they're not decolonising models of practice. They're not about power or social justice or equity. They're about behaving in a certain way. So that's fine. It's not wrong. But it doesn't, for me, it doesn't have the broadness uh, and applicability of cultural safety. That's it. Okay, Robin, there are a few other questions in the chat. I'll just go through them. So can you please list the key outcomes again, please. So maybe the outcomes of the cultural of the framework. safety framework. That um, yeah, sure. And people will be able to get a copy of this, won't they? Yes. The, um, the what do you call it? Um, the slides. The and slides, the yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, now I've just got to find it now. So there were four outcomes of the framework, a cultural safety policy, code of conduct on cultural safety and a reconcilia reconciliation action plan. So that was one like set of documents, cultural orientation modules, six, and uh, acknowledgement of capacity building and upskilling or st for staff development and formal roles for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff. Uh, educators, mentors and advisors. Okay. Mark has asked for the name of the book to go into the chat, please, and I'll have to get you to do that in a minute, um, Robin. 
unless I go back to the name of it. Do you want to just repeat the name? Um, you think maybe no, Christabel? You? I'll do that. I'll sort that. Okay, Christabel. Yeah, thank do. you. <laughs> given okay. the given the fun, so it's called cultural Diver culture diversity and health in Australia towards culturally safe care, and it's by Routledge 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 or however you say it. And it was published last year, twenty twenty one. Okay, there's another uh, question. Um, you spoke earlier about having a mentor in cultural safety. Should this be an Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal person? Um, I didn't have a mentor in cultural safety as such. I had, no, not in cultural safety. Um, I think we're talking about two different things here. I had um, I sought out people that could mentor me and mentor me in terms of ways of working in that particular context, which was with in the Faculty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Study, and how the heck do you um, how the heck do you do this? So I had people like people with various experiences who'd been there a lot longer than I had, and you know, so we yeah, there were a couple of people that mentored me certainly in terms of um, figuring out the theory of things. In, in the mentors that I'm talking about uh, as formal Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff roles, that's a different thing. They would be mentoring new people that would come into the organisation and working with them for as long as they needed to. But that's, that's a different thing. So in terms of mentors, it wouldn't have to be necessarily an Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander person. For example, if the person was had started work with, say, the Northern Territory HIV AIDS Council, they would need mentoring there, perhaps, or have a mentor there that could inculcate them and orientate them to those ways of working and the groups of people that they were working with. So that's more what I meant in terms of mentor. Okay, Robin, uh, a question from Tamara. How do you facilitate self-awareness to happen? In my experience, the understanding bias courses rarely prompt people to genuinely self-reflect. It's such a hard <laughs> space to support. Don't get me started on unconscious bias. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of um, the whole unconscious bias thing. I think it's a particularly uh, North American thing and um, it's related to, and I think probably a descendant of the work that uh, a woman called Jane, very brave work that a woman called Jane Elliott used to do, blue eyes, brown eyes. <clears throat> but there's a lot of, uh, and some people in Australia, a couple of people in South Australia also did um, some similar work, but it's very fraught. Um, yeah, look, at it, it, it is tricky, but the way I actually address that area is that's when we explore who we are so I, I you know because uh, I used to teach a unit called cultural safety and healthcare, and we would start by you know I know people a lot of people are going to groan but we would start by getting people to do a mind map of their cultural selves of their cultural identity and inevitably there'd be so many non-indigenous people would go hmm, I don't really know what to put here and, but it's just getting people to that point to think about who they are and what they are. That's where you start the work. So people can, oh, so the fact that I'm a third generation do-gooder, that, that may, that's why I, I'm still trying to rescue people even in my mid-60s. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done on ourselves. Okay, thanks, Robin. There's another related question, and it's from Rachel. Um, is reflective practice a necessary mechanism to promote cultural safety? If so, what skills or training do those who are supervising need to have? I Well, yeah, I think I've said uh, probably a couple of times that critical critical reflective practice is a, is a key component of cultural safety. You have to be able to, you know, like take a good hard look at yourself and do that continually. Like I still stuff up, I still make mistakes, I'm still not perfect, I still project way too much onto people 
And being a reflective practitioner is very, very much part of that. And everyone, everyone needs to do that. I think I've forgotten the rest of the question. Uh, so it was, if, if so, so if, if reflective yes. practice is a component, so what skills yes. or training do those who are supervising need to have? How, I guess that's how do you... Well, it's part of everyone. Encourage. That's why it's necessary for everybody to go through some kind of staff development or process where they do critical reflection. So say for the, for the art show that I was, the Community Controlled Health Organisation where, that I developed the framework for, they, have, they, would ha they will have the six cultural orientation modules. But part of the ongoing development will be then like sort of follow-up workshops, if you like, where people can get together and debrief and say, look, this happened. Um, how could I have done this better? How could I have done things differently? So having the opportunities, I think, for staff to do that, or all staff, so not just supervisors or, um, you know, um, open office dwellers, everyone needs to do it. Okay. But it needs right. to be a recognised, regularly scheduled, resourced part of the staff development. Hey, Robin, I've got a, a comment and a question together. So this is from Beth. And she says, thank you so much, Robin. That was a great presentation. And the question is, I work in a research centre for natural hazards. We're currently developing a reconciliation action plan. And I'd be very interested to eventually work with someone to develop a cultural safety framework. Is there a group or organisation who might be able to help us do this? Uh, short answer, no. <laughs> um, but that's that's fantastic that you're that's where your your thinking is at. That's really really good, and to be able to see that wraps a part of the process, but not the whole process. So that's really good, and that's a start. And I think you know what would be really nice if we could have some kind of repository where a cultural safety framework template exists and uh, where people can go in and have a look at that and then sit with the organisation and work it out themselves because it has to come from within the organisation. It has to reflect what you, what, it, what the organisation needs it to be. Um, yeah, and hire a consultant. That's assuming there's money to do that, of course, but you know, it's not, and it's like many things, it's not often given priority. Okay, Robin Kelly says, uh, thank you, Robin. As an Aboriginal psychologist, it's nice to hear a presentation that sits with my values. Thank you. Very good. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, and from Sh 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 Shuli, I hope I've got that right. Dear Robin, it was an excellent presentation, resonated so well with my experience working in the field of Aboriginal health and education for more than 15 years. I've had those aha. Uh -huh, Huh? <laughs> so many times. And from Anne, thanks for a great presentation. My takeaway is the vital importance of genuine reflection and self-awareness as a basis for self-organisational and practice improvement. And thank you, Anne, uh, for that reflection. Yeah, you can't do it on your own, basically. <laughs> well, you shouldn't have to do it, but it starts with you, but you don't do it on your own. Okay, and Hayley has just put uh, in a resource. So she says the, well, which is AES. So AES has a first national cultural safety framework on their website. It's a pretty handy document with some checklists and links to other resources. It is. So can, I, can I just comment on that? Because I've had a yes. good look at that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, where, are the, where are my comments? I did have some comments to say about that. So I think oh. it's First Nations rather than First National. Yeah. Yes. Um, no, I can't find it now. Because oh. yes, I've had a I've had a, a good look at that framework, and it's um, it is 
and I'm not trying to trivialise this or, or like say anything negative about it at all, but it is aimed at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So, and I, I, I still think that um, we need to be looking at all, like a, a range of um, contexts, not just focusing on, on one particular ethnicity. Because that's not what, as I said a few times, that's not what cultural safety is meant to be about. And that was coming from Ira Harvey Ramsden herself. Um, Robin, there's a really good question in the chat. Yes. Um, when, when you feel that your cultural safety has been affected, how do you tell the other person? And look, again, that's, um, that would have to be addressed in context. That is really, really hard. I um, was talking to uh, an Aboriginal colleague a, a few weeks ago where someone had said to them, um, oh, I didn't even know you were Aboriginal. Like, that was okay to say. And so we, we, we talked about ways that that can be addressed because it's, it's a really fine line between challenging people and um, shutting them down like and cementing their prejudices and it's a really fine line and I think as allies us non-Indigenous people have to be prepared to step up and take that on as well it's really it's a very tricky thing but but it's complex it's context dependent because you don't you don't want to be that person you know the the angry person yeah, it's, it's hard. It's re it's tricky. Okay, Robin. I think we're going to have to wrap up. We've just gone over the one o'clock time frame, and I know people are having to leave and uh, get to other meetings or to other commitments. So I'd just like to thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise with us. It, it was really informative and interesting, um, and really great to hear about your uh, your stories and. Um, where it came from for you. Mm -hmm.